In England, when a monarch ascends to the throne, the king or the queen, as the case may be, is invested with authority and with status and dominion. But also, the king or the queen is given a list of titles like Your Majesty. One of the titles that's always intrigued me is the title Defensor Fide, the Defender of the Faith. That's because in England, England has a state church, and traditionally it is the responsibility of the monarch to use the power of the army or the sword or whatever it takes to defend the church. But in church history, God has given us great men who have defended the faith not by the sword or with military might, but with their lips and with their pens. We have the portraits of some of the greatest defenders of the faith in all of church history. John Calvin, of course, from the 16th century, St. Augustine from the early centuries of the church, Jonathan Edwards from here in America from the 18th century, St. Thomas Aquinas, Benjamin Breckenridge Warfield from Princeton, and of course, Francis Schaeffer, our 20th century defender of the faith. In the series of mock debates that you are about to see, I am convinced that you are going to have the opportunity of hearing from the one who, in my judgment, is the greatest living Christian apologist, the defender of the faith par excellence, Dr. John Gerstner. This debate is entitled, Can We Know Truth? We are about to begin a series of unrehearsed debates between myself and my colleague, Dr. John Gerstner. Now, it's important to note at the outset that these debates are, properly speaking, mock debates. That means that, uh, in one sense, they're insincere inasmuch as the positions I will be espousing will be positions that I myself do not believe or adhere to. My ignominious role in this exercise is to serve as the devil's advocate. I'd like to say that uh, that role was chosen by Lot, but instead uh, we tried out for the parts and I lost. <laughs> but uh, in our first session together, Dr. Gerstner, we're going to be discussing the question of truth and ethics. And let me begin by calling attention to what is clear, I'm sure, to you and everyone else, that we live in an age that has been marked by extraordinary discoveries in science that in turn have influenced philosophy and theology and all of the other disciplines. And one that has certainly made an impact on my thinking is the uh, concept of relativity as it has changed the whole structure of the modern world. But not only is relativity something that we conceive of with respect to science, but I think now safely with respect to all truth. I notice that you Christians tend to make bold declarations and affirmations about truth, and yet from my perspective as a modern person, I have to say, Dr. Gerstner, that as far as I can see, truth is relative. So how would you respond to that? Well, there's one level at which I would agree with it thoroughly. Truth is relative to the understanding mind, for example. There's a truth out there which is addressed to you and to me and to the audience out there, and it's understood by you and me and the audience out there, and it's understood relative to each one of us. I don't think there's anything objectionable to that uh, notion, but I think I know what's up your sleeve, Mr. Devil's Advocate, and how you are going to make something rather sinister out of it. But since you put the question to me at the outset, what is my Christian reaction to relativity? It's very affirmative as far as that's concerned. 
God and the world and everything else is relative to the knowing mind. I see no problems with that from a Christian standpoint. What I'm saying, though, Dr. Gerster, yeah. is not simply that I have to relate to God and to the world and to propositions that people make here and there. In that sense, we're all relatives Good. one uh, of another. I'm not disputing that. Okay. But what I'm saying is that the truth itself is conditioned by my perception of it. And that uh, what may be true, for example, for you uh, in your religious uh, devotion, you may believe that there is a God. Uh, an eternal God who's the object of your devotion and of your prayers and your preaching and that sort of thing. So that for you, Dr. Gerstner, it's true to say there is a God because you relate to that. It has meaning for you and significance to you. But for me, Dr. Gerstner, <laughs> that doesn't mean anything. There's no God. So for me, it's true to say God does not exist. That's what I mean when I say the truth is relative. You're quite correct when you say that we Christians say there is a God. Now, first of all, that's a proposition which I maintain is a true proposition. Now, you are hostile to it, but I take it you're not hostile to a definition of the term. You understand the same as I understand what that proposition means. Would you agree with me on that? Yes, I think okay. we could have a basic agreement of, as the meaning of the statement in the sense of as a sentence and as a proposition, we both understand right. what these words right. and connection right. uh, communicate. Yes, I understand that. But what I'm saying, Dr. Gerson, is that you affirm the truth of That's this statement. That's exactly so. And because it's meaningful to you, it is true for it's you. It's meaningful to you, but you affirm the falsehood of it. Well, I don't believe there is a God. You don't believe there's a God, but that's a meaningful proposition to which you give that negative response. That's correct. It's a meaningful proposition to which I give an affirmative response. And the rational thing for rational people to do at a point like this is to ask, what's the reason I affirm it? Or what's the reason you deny it? Well, do you want to take the initiative, or do you well, want me to? I, I say the reason I deny it is that, it, that I don't get any particular uh, a personal uh, significance out of it. It's irrelevant to my life. Uh, if there is uh, this God that you put so much stock in and believe in, I don't know anything about him, and he you're doesn't make any difference to me. You're saying it's irrelevant. Now, that is a, an irrelevant, uh, that is a non rational proposition, I would say, because if this being does exist, and I'm assuming a dictionary definition of the term, just as you, he is the author of your being. And for you to stand there and say, that is irrelevant to me, doesn't sound like a very brilliant observation. Well, what I'm saying is, is that, that there is a God, that that may be true for you, because I'm saying that truth okay. is defined by personal meaning. All right. And because you find meaning in this to your own life, subjective significance, then I would agree, Dr. Gerstner, that this is a true statement. There is a God. That's true. But what I'm saying is it's true for you. It's not true for me because I don't believe it. Now, you're shifting to another subject, but before you do, if we're going to make any progress in this discussion and debate, we've got to go step at a time. You are withdrawing the statement that that is irrelevant. This is highly relevant to you unless you can prove that this being does not exist. Now, you have insinuated that it can't be proven because truth is proven by feeling. And you don't have any positive feeling about That's that. That's exactly what I'm saying. Okay. I'm saying now, since it? when is truth determined just by positive being? Would you deny that this being about whom you have a negative feeling therefore does not exist because this devil's advocate does not have a positive feeling about him? That's correct. You'd consider that a rational remark? Well, I'm not interested whether it's rational. And this is a matter of what I'm saying. I thought we were talking about truth. Assume, we are talking about truth, but we're trying to get a definition. And I'm saying to you, you want to have, you want to have a rational, objective concept of truth. 
I'm yeah. telling you, we don't live in the dark ages anymore. The age of rationalism is over, Dr. Gershner. Welcome to the 20th century. I have an existential view of truth. And for me, as an existentialist, see, truth is an experience. It's an encounter. It's, 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 it's feeling more than rational propositions. And you want to insist uh, the truth is some kind of objective, rational system. You want to say that any truth, this or any other truth, stirs up a certain feeling in an individual if it's going to be significant. I gather you're not denying the objectivity of the concept, but what you're still going back to is that it's not relevant to me unless I am internally involved in it positively. That's it's right. not just internally involved in it. You can be internally involved in it in a hostile fashion. Yes, I would grant that. I can, okay. That would be relevant okay. in a negative sense. All right, relevant. so yes. R.C. Sproul is actually affected by truth affects this devil's advocate and so on. And therefore, it is evaluated, but presumably, before it can even affect you, it has to be a proposition you understand and respond to negatively, does it not? That's correct. Okay. So this particular truth is not subjectivized just because it stimulates a certain kind of subjective response in you, negative, in me, positive. But you are not shifting away from truth by simply saying the thing that's really relevant or significant or interesting to R.C. Sproul is that it affects me negatively and therefore I dismiss it. But you, I withdraw, I mean, I'm challenging your proposition that this is not an objective entity simply because the important thing about it, in your opinion, is how this entity affects you. And as a matter of fact, and it affects you negatively. That's correct. Okay, so it's not even the affected that's concerned. It's the negativity of the effect. But it's still an objective to which you negatively respond. All right, but again, you're assuming that there really is such a being to which I'm not just merely responding to a proposition. But I grant the objectivity of the proposition. Yep. Every proposition is objective. Right. But the proposition is describing something beyond itself. We're not arguing about this sentence. We're arguing about the content of this sentence, which is the existence of God. That's really the next step. All right. But the point is that you have given up this notion that, uh, that subjectivity or relativity or existential relativity, relativity is what's important about that. And I'm uh, denying that. And then you take a really sound, rational statement when you infer that whether this affects a person negatively or positively would depend entirely on whether or not this being can be not only stated as a proposition, but proved to exist as a rational being. You mean proved to exist apart from me and apart from you? Oh, if it be a being like this, yes, of, course of course he would exist independently. All right, I would have, I would have to grant, uh, Dr. Okay, Gerstner, okay. and uh, maybe to my boss's chagrin. Yes, he would that, be too uh, happy with this. That if there is a God right. out there, right. apart from my feelings, apart from my relationships and all of that, and apart from your relationship right. and all of that, right. I, would have to, I would have to grant that that would be relevant. Okay. Then let see, me try to show you that this right, God well, must be well, right. Before you do that, let me, let me say to you uh, what I'm struggling with here. That I guess the reason why I'm saying that this proposition becomes a matter of personal subjective preference, if you will, is because I don't really think we can know okay. in the final analysis if there is such a being independent of your uh -huh. personal feelings uh -huh. about it and uh -huh. my personal feelings. What I mean, Dr. Gerstner, is you, I don't think we can know whether there is such a being, but it doesn't matter because if you respond positively, for you it's true, 
And if I don't respond positively, then for me, it's not a viable truth in my life. But, but I have to, I'm still, what I'm saying is, I'm not agnostic about that we can make sentences that are objective. And I'm not even agnostic about what you said here, that if there is a God, it would be relevant. But I'm not agnostic about whether we can know such a truth. Well, when we all agree on the fact that if there be such a being as that, it's highly relevant how you feel about him. And uh, if he does exist and you feel negatively about him, you're in a bad way. And if I feel positively about him, I'm in a good way. That's all accepted. The whole point now rests in this one thing, whether we can know this being. Now, you're maintaining that we can't even know before we even deal with the question because the only kind of knowing that you're interested in and want to maintain is the only kind of knowing possible is one that affects you positively. That's your subtle underlying implication. No, I've qualified that. I've said that that only comes into play in areas where we're dealing with subjects or questions that I'm convinced we can't know about objectively. Well, what do rational people do when one person says we can't know and the other person says we can know? Where do you go from there? Well, you have to debate it. That's okay. why we're here. Now, do you want you to know? prove he can't exist or do you want me to prove he can exist? Well, no, no, no. I'm not going to say that. I didn't say that he doesn't exist. I said we can't know. I'm not being, uh, you, you know. You know he exists. You admit that. What? You just said it. I don't care. We know he, it, it no, the important. No, I said we can't. We cannot know that he exists. You're going to say that. How are you yes. going to prove that you can't know God exists? Because he's beyond the pale you of You already know a great example, deal about him, don't for, you? Wait a minute. For example, for example certainly as a, a theologian, as a philosopher, you're well aware of the uh, monumental critique of the traditional arguments for the existence of God that was uh, proffered by Immanuel Kant. Yes, and I'm you, familiar uh, with you that. You know that Kant has, has shown that that uh, of such a being as, as you describe as God is in a realm that is beyond our ability to get at. I mean, we can't see him, we can't touch him, we can't taste him. We have no access to a metaphysical realm beyond the physical things that we can investigate through science. So God cannot be a, an object of scientific inquiry. We and, can't know and God. And we can't know him rationally. What other way is there? We can't know God because Kant said we can't know God. <laughs> well, Dr. Gerstner, you know that's not the argument. Well, that 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 I, that's not said? an argument. I've just reminded you uh, that Kant has made that conclusion. Yes, he I has. I think that he's done it validly. I was using shorthand, aware of the fact that you would know Shh. the arguments that Kant I also given. know it as non-cogent. If you're going to show me it's uh, cogent, I'll be see. very interested. Well, tell me, first of all, how can you know anything about a being who is beyond the scope of sense perception? The, uh, this being could, for example, you're just asking me how it would be possible. Yes. I can answer you on a hypothetical matter, which I think is true. This being who is beyond visibility and beyond total comprehensibility, could make things by means of which he would reveal the nature of his being. I'm a finite person, and he could, re he could actually create things that are finite also, which could cue me into the fact that he's the author of those things. That would be telling me something about him that he's already there at the beginning and that he makes these things and he's intelligent in the way he goes about it and he's benign in his tendency and he's moral too because he's affect me morally as well. I, what I hear coming out of your mouth, forgive me if I'm being presumptuous, but is nothing more than the old cosmological argument for the existence of God that I thought that Kant demolished here. Is it not? Aren't you uh, pleading cosmologically? You're saying God makes a universe, uh -huh. He makes a cosmos, and even though He never shows up in it personally, we can't see Him. He's invisible to our eyes. We don't hear His words spoken audibly, but we see the universe, and you're saying somehow that universe reveals something to me about God. 
You're giving a very fine statement, a cosmological no, argument. Now, why that, don't you make that, a critique of it while you're uh, at it? All right, isn't that what you're arguing for? I'm using it. You're well, not showing any you, fallacy how, in it. How does the, how can we get through this massive leap from looking at uh, this podium or the blackboard to... You use all these pejorative terms. To the, to, to, well, we are moving to a very We're high moving, degree. We're moving and leaping are two different <laughs> things, my friend. But I think a leaping is something we do when we want to get up in the air. Yeah, well, we want to get up in the air here. We want to get off the terrestrial I'm saying I'm not going to bow before your use of pejorative <laughs> language. I'm going to insist that okay. you put some cogency all right, in What there. I want to know is how, Dr. Gerstner, you can reason from this created realm uh -huh. to this invisible creator. Okay, I've already told you, and you've been mocked it out, but I'll say it again, and I'll ask you, if you don't have to take this mock debate so seriously <laughs> as that to give mock arguments, you know, on, that you will actually address what I say rather than make authoritative statements no, to Immanuel Kant thought differently. I'm simply trying to identify the lead. argument as the cosmological argument. Now, I would say, with, with Kant, yes. my ally, okay. that what it requires to move, whether it's a gentle step, okay. a okay. progression up a ladder, rationally move, you know, I'm, or we we're talking sense in the air now. here, whatever yeah. it is, Dr. Gerstner, yeah. we are moving, you grant that, we're not leaving. from this sphere, okay, but we are moving from this sphere right. to exactly. some metaphysical sphere. Now, it would seem to me, Dr. Gerstner, that in order to do that, yeah. we would have to make some assumptions, which I think with Kant, such as, as all right, I, I will seem give to get the, an I'm argument going, out ready, of you. I'm trying to give it to you, yeah, that I'll the wait. assumption that we're making that I would regard as gratuitous, as a leap, Go ahead. Now is, I know what Immanuel is. Kant and R.C. Sproul right. and the devil's advocate the leap advocate is right, One little that, argument, That the please. assumption here, Dr. Gerstner, okay. is that w the law of causality, okay, which we use right. in our scientific inquiry okay. of this world, that's true, would apply to this other world equally. That is not necessarily true. Aren't you resting your case on some kind of causal deduction? Oh, I am, but that doesn't mean that in this other world it would be exactly the same. Well, how do For me you? to argue from this world to the fact that it requires this God in this other world you're talking about is one thing. To say that God's self-knowledge would be of the same nature as something else again. But we don't have to get that. All we need, as far as our debate is concerned, is for you to show me this is a gratuitous leap and that these cosmological arguments that you denigrate so liberally and so on are actually non-cogent. You just don't All like right. the idea of moving from this world to the other world. You're assuming that because there's a world here, there has to be I'm an I'm not assuming anything. You're the guy who's putting that word All assumption right, I'm, in I'm, I, Correct me. I'm think, I, what I'm hearing you say is that because there's a world here right. that we can perceive exactly. that is visible Exactly. To What's us, that, that is an assumption. Because that world is here, all right? right? No, that's not the assumption. I'm saying that what I'm assuming, or what I think you're yeah. assuming or arguing for, is that because we can perceive this world here, right. this world somehow bears witness to an antecedent cause. That's true. That is God. That would have to be God. He'd only and the be... reasoning that we use to get there is causal. Is that correct? Okay. All right, so that now you have this antecedent cause right. for this visible universe. Okay. Why does there have to be an antecedent cause? Why does it have to be what? Why does there have to be some kind of antecedent cause behind the universe? Why can't the universe be its own cause? All right, let's, uh, uh, let's hypothecate that. Let's say uh, for a moment here, you're going to prove now, you're taking on the business of proving that we can't know God, and you're going to say, why can't we assume that this world is eternal, huh? No. It, no? I Correct said, me. What are you wanting It's its me? own cause. Its own cause. So, presumably, indefinitely. If it's its own cause, it's been there, presumably now. If it's there now and its own cause, 
it presumably it would have existed this way, or at least in some shape or Or we could go through an infinite series of finite causes and so on, but the, if, if you're the one who's saying finite causes, you won't even let me finish my okay. sentence, but all right, finite causes. That's your language now, right? Yes. You got a series of finite clauses. Well, manifestly, if they're finite, they can't be unlimited, can they? No. And they could not, of course, have existed uh, of themselves finitely or temporally. Not any single one of them. Or all of but them. But the series. But could they're be all infinite. finite, aren't they not? Isn't that what you've been saying? No, I say each of the causes right. is a finite cause, yeah. but the series is infinite. Uh, uh, each of these finite uh, items, each finite uh, item, depends on its own. I just want to make sure I get what you're saying. It takes the shape of an argument and not a mere accusation and so on. Each finite item has own cause. That's correct. Infinitely. Yes. Eternally. Yes. All right, now suppose for this, I don't believe that's the case. I'm, but I'm like my friend Thomas Aquinas over there. He maintained you couldn't prove you wrong at this particular point. I think we could, but I'll go along with the master Thomistic reasoner at this point and grant you that what I consider diabolical thought, that the universe could actually be eternal, okay? But nevertheless, you have ventured into the open now, as you devils don't like to do. Well, actually, this has just been an exercise to warm us up to go further on this discussion of the existence of God. What I was trying to get from you here is the groundwork, the method that you use to try to prove such a thing as the existence of God. And I see that what you're doing is you're using uh, your senses for the world and then your reason to to go back to this yeah. first cause. Yeah. All right, I understand that. I, I know you that. don't like it, but I, I don't, don't like it, reputation. but I get the point. But it's, there's still some things I need to, to iron out with you on this, and we'll take them up in the next session. If you don't mind, I appreciate your patience with this uh, poor fallen devil. <laughs> but uh, uh, we'll go on and, 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 and really look at this uh, more sharply in our next uh, engagement. Yes.